Section 1 of Sophisms of the Protectionists. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sophisms of the Protectionists by Frederic Bastiat. Translated by Horace White. Section 1. Part 1. Sophisms of Protection. First Series. Introduction. My object in this little volume has been to refute some of the arguments usually advanced against free trade. I am not seeking a combat with the protectionists. I merely advance a principle which I am anxious to present clearly to the minds of sincere men, who hesitate because they doubt. I am not of the number of those who maintain that protection is supported by interests. I believe that it is founded upon errors, or, if you will, upon incomplete truths. Too many fear free trade for this apprehension to be other than sincere. My aspirations are perhaps high, but I confess that it would give me pleasure to hope that this little work might become, as it were, a manual for such men as may be called upon to decide between the two principles. When one has not made oneself perfectly familiar with the doctrines of free trade, the sophisms of protection perpetually return to the mind under one form or another, and on each occasion, in order to counteract their effect, it is necessary to enter into a long and laborious analysis. Few, at least, of all legislators, have leisure for this labor, which I would, on this account, wish to present clearly, drawn up to their hand. But it may be said, are the benefits of free trade so hidden as to be perceptible only to economists by profession? Yes, we confess it. Our adversaries in the discussion have a signal advantage over us. They can, in a few words, present an incomplete truth, which, for us to show that it is incomplete, renders necessary long and uninteresting dissertations. This results from the fact that protection accumulates upon a single point the good which it affects, while the evil inflicted is infused throughout the mass. The one strikes the eye at a first glance, while the other becomes perceptible only to close investigation. With regard to free trade, precisely the reverse is the case. It is thus with almost all questions of political economy. If you say, for instance, there is a machine which has turned out of employment thirty workmen. Or again, there is a spendthrift who encourages every kind of industry. Or, the conquest of Algiers has doubled the commerce of Marseilles. Or, once more, the public taxes support one hundred thousand families. You are understood at once. Your propositions are clear, simple, and true in themselves. If you deduce from them the principle that, machines are evil, that sumptuous extravagance, conquest, and heavy imposts are blessings, your theory will have the more success, because you will be able to base it upon indisputable facts. But we, for our part, cannot stop at a cause, and its immediate effect, for we know that this effect may in turn become itself a cause. To judge of a measure, it is necessary that we should follow it from step to step, from result to result, until through the successive links of the chain of events we arrive at the final effect. We must, in short, reason. But here we are assailed by clamorous exclamations. You are theorists, metaphysicians, ideologists, utopians, men of maxims, and immediately all the prejudices of the public are against us. What then shall we do? we must invoke the patience and candor of the reader, giving to our deductions, if we are capable of it, sufficient clearness to throw forward at once, without disguise or palliation, the true and the false, in order, once for all, to determine whether the victory should be for restriction or free trade. I wish here to make a remark of some importance. Some extracts from this volume have appeared in the Journal des Economists, in an article otherwise quite complimentary, published by the Viscount de Romanet, 
see Moniteur Industrial of the 15th and 18th of May, 1845, he intimates that I ask for the suppression of custom houses. Mr. de Romanet is mistaken. I ask for the suppression of the protective policy. We do not dispute the right of government to impose taxes, but would, if possible, dissuade producers from taxing one another. It was said by Napoleon that duties should never be a fiscal instrument, but a means of protecting industry. We plead the contrary, and say that duties should never be made an instrument of reciprocal rapine, but that they may be employed as a useful fiscal machine. I am so far from asking for the suppression of duties, that I look upon them as the anchor on which the future salvation of our finances will depend. I believe that they may bring immense receipts into the treasury, and, to give my entire and undisguised opinion, I am inclined, from the slow progress of healthy economical doctrines, and from the magnitude of our budget, to hope more for the cause of commercial reform from the necessities of the treasury than from the force of an enlightened public opinion. 1. Abundance, Scarcity which is the best for man or for society, abundance or scarcity? How, it may be exclaimed, can such a question be asked? Has it ever been pretended, is it possible to maintain, that scarcity can be the basis of a man's happiness? Yes, this has been maintained, this is daily maintained, and I do not hesitate to say that the scarcity theory is by far the most popular of the day. It furnishes the subject of discussions, in conversations, journals, books, courts of justice, and, extraordinary as it may appear, it is certain that political economy will have fulfilled its task and its practical mission when it shall have rendered common and irrefutable the simple proposition that, in abundance, consist man's riches. Do we not hear it said every day, foreign nations are inundating us with their productions. Then we fear abundance. Has not Mr. de St. Crick said, Production is superabundant? Then he fears abundance. Do we not see workmen destroying and breaking machinery? They are frightened by the excess of production. In other words, they fear abundance. Has not Mr. Bugard said, Let bread be dear, and the agriculturalist will be rich? Now, bread can only be dear because it is scarce. Then Mr. Bugard lauded scarcity. Has not Mr. D'Argao produced the fruitfulness of the sugar culture as an argument against it? Has he not said, The beet cannot have a permanent and extended cultivation, because a few acres given up to it in each department, would furnish sufficient for the consumption of all France. Then, in his opinion, good consists in sterility and scarcity, evil in fertility and abundance. La Presse, Le Commerce, and the majority of our journals are every day publishing articles whose aim is to prove to the chambers and to government what a wise policy should seek to raise prices by tariffs, and do we not daily see these powers obeying these injunctions of the press? Now, tariffs can only raise prices by diminishing the quantity of goods offered for sale. Then, here we see newspapers, the legislature, the ministry, all guided by the scarcity theory, and I was correct in my statement that this theory is by far the most popular. How then has it happened? that in the eyes at once of laborers, editors, and statesmen, abundance should appear alarming, and scarcity advantageous. It is my intention to endeavor to show the origin of this delusion. A man becomes rich in proportion to the profitableness of his labor, that is to say, in proportion as he sells his productions at a high price. The price of his productions is high in proportion to their scarcity. It is plain, then, that, as far as regards him at least, scarcity enriches him. 
applying successively this mode of reasoning to each class of laborers individually, the scarcity theory is deduced from it. To put this theory into practice, and in order to favor each class of labor, an artificial scarcity is forced in every kind of production, by prohibition, restriction, suppression of machinery, and other analogous measures. In the same manner it is observed that when an article is abundant, it brings a small price. The gains of the producer are, of course, less. If this is the case with all produce, all producers are then poor. Abundance then ruins society. And as any strong conviction will always seek to force itself into practice, we see, in many countries, the laws aiming to prevent abundance. This sophism, stated in a general form, would produce but a slight impression. But when applied to any particular order of facts, to any particular article of industry, to any one class of labor, it is extremely specious, because it is a syllogism, which is not false, but incomplete. And what is true in a syllogism always necessarily presents itself to the mind, while the incomplete, which is a negative quality, an unknown value, is easily forgotten in the calculation. Man produces in order to consume. He is at once producer and consumer. The argument given above considers him only under the first point of view. Let us look at him in the second character, and the conclusion will be different. We may say, the consumer is rich in proportion as he buys at a low price. He buys at a low price in proportion to the abundance of the article in demand. Abundance, then, enriches him. This reasoning, extended to all consumers, must lead to the theory of abundance. It is the imperfectly understood notion of exchange of produce which leads to these fallacies. If we consult our individual interest, we perceive immediately that it is double. As sellers, we are interested in high prices, consequently in scarcity. As buyers, our advantage is in cheapness, or, what is the same thing, abundance. It is impossible, then, to found a proper system of reasoning upon either the one or the other of these separate interests before determining which of the two coincides and identifies itself with the general and permanent interests of mankind. If man were a solitary animal, working exclusively for himself, consuming the fruit of his own personal labor, if, in a word, he did not exchange his produce, the theory of scarcity could never have introduced itself into the world. It would be too strikingly evident that abundance, whencesoever derived, is advantageous to him, whether this abundance might be the result of his own labor, of ingenious tools, or of powerful machinery, whether due to the fertility of the soil, to the liberality of nature, or to an inundation of foreign goods, such as the sea, bringing from distant regions, might cast upon his shores. Never would the solitary man have dreamed, in order to encourage his own labor, of destroying his instruments for facilitating his work, of neutralizing the fertility of the soil, or of casting back into the sea the produce of its bounty. He would understand that his labor was a means, not an end, and that it would be absurd to reject the object in order to encourage the means. He would understand that if he has required two hours per day to supply his necessities, anything which spares him an hour of this labor, leaving the result the same, gives him this hour to dispose of as he pleases, in adding to his comforts. In a word, he would understand that every step in the saving of labor is a step in the improvement of his condition. But traffic clouds our vision in the contemplation of this simple truth. In a state of society with the division of labor to which it leads, the production and consumption of an article no longer belong to the same individual. Each now looks upon his labor not as a means, but as an end. The exchange of produce creates with regard to each object 
two separate interests, that of the producer and that of the consumer, and these two interests are always directly opposed to each other. It is essential to analyze and study the nature of each. Let us then suppose a producer of whatever kind. What is his immediate interest? It consists in two things. First, that the smallest possible number of individuals should devote themselves to the business which he follows. And, secondly, that the greatest possible number should seek the articles of his produce. In the more succinct terms of political economy, the supply should be small, the demand large, or yet, in other words, limited competition, unlimited consumption. What, on the other side, is the immediate interest of the consumer? That the supply should be large, the demand small. As these two interests are immediately opposed to each other, it follows that if one coincides with the general interest of society, the other must be adverse to it. Which then, if either, should legislation favor as contributing most to the good of the community? To determine this question, it suffices to inquire in which the secret desires of the majority of men would be accomplished. Inasmuch as we are producers, it must be confessed that we have each of us antisocial desires. Are we vine growers? It would not distress us were the frost to nip all the vines in the world except our own. This is the scarcity theory. Are we iron workers? We would desire, whatever might be the public need, that the market should offer no iron but our own. And precisely for the same reason, that this need, painfully felt and imperfectly supplied, causes us to receive a high price for our iron. Again, here is the theory of scarcity. Are we agriculturalists? We say with Mr. Bugod, let bread be dear, that is to say scarce, and our business goes well. Again, the theory of scarcity. Are we physicians? We cannot but see that certain physical ameliorations such as the improved climate of the country, the development of certain moral virtues, the progress of knowledge pushed to the extent of enabling each individual to take care of his own health, the discovery of certain simple remedies, easily applied, would be so many fatal blows to our profession. As physicians, then, our secret desires are antisocial. I must not be understood to imply that physicians allow themselves to form such desires. I am happy to believe that they would hail with joy a universal panacea. But in such a sentiment, it is the man, the Christian, who manifests himself, and who, by a praiseworthy abnegation of self, takes that point of view of the question, which belongs to the consumer. As a physician exercising his profession, and gaining from this profession his standing in society, his comforts, even the means of existence of his family, it is impossible but that his desires, or, if you please so to word it, his interests, should be antisocial. Are we manufacturers of cotton goods? We desire to sell them at the price most advantageous to ourselves we would willingly consent to the suppression of all rival manufactories. And if we dare not publicly express this desire, or pursue the complete realization of it with some success, we do so, at least to a certain extent, by indirect means, as, for example, the exclusion of foreign goods, in order to diminish the quantity offered, and to produce thus by forcible means, and for our own profits, a scarcity of clothing. We might thus pass in review every business and every profession, and should always find that the producers, in their character of producers, have invariably antisocial interests. The shopkeeper, says Montaigne, succeeds in his business through the extravagance of youth, the laborer by the high price of grain, the architect by the decay of houses, officers of justice by lawsuits and quarrels. The standing and occupation even of ministers of religion are drawn from our death and our vices. No physician takes pleasure in the health even of his friends, 
no soldier in the peace of his country, and so on with all. If then the secret desires of each producer were realized, the world would rapidly retrograde towards barbarism. The sail would prescribe steam. The oar would prescribe the sail, only in its turn to give way to wagons, the wagon to the mule, and the mule to the foot peddler. Wool would exclude cotton, cotton would exclude wool, and thus on, until the scarcity and want of everything would cause man himself to disappear from the face of the globe. If we now go on to consider the immediate interest of the consumer, we shall find it in perfect harmony with the public interest, and with the well-being of humanity. When the buyer presents himself in the market, he desires to find it abundantly furnished. He sees with pleasure propitious seasons for harvesting, wonderful inventions putting within his reach the largest possible quantity of produce, time and labor saved, distances effaced, the spirit of peace and justice diminishing the weight of taxes, every barrier to improvement cast down, and in all this his interest runs parallel with an enlightened public interest. He may push his secret desires to an absurd and chimerical height, but never can they cease to be humanizing in their tendency. He may desire that food and clothing, house and hearth, instruction and morality, security and peace, strength and health, should come to us without limit and without labor or effort on our part, as the water of the stream, the air which we breathe, and the sunbeams in which we bask. But never could the realization of his most extravagant wishes run counter to the good of society. It may be said, perhaps, that, were these desires granted, the labor of the producer, constantly checked, would end by being entirely arrested for want of support. But why? Because in this extreme supposition, every imaginable need and desire would be completely satisfied. Man, like the all-powerful, would create by the single act of his will. How, in such a hypothesis, could laborious production be regretted? Imagine a legislative assembly composed of producers, of whom each member should cause to pass into a law his secret desire as a producer. The code which would emanate from such an assembly could be nothing but systematized monopoly, the scarcity theory put into practice. In the same manner, an assembly in which each member should consult only his immediate interest of consumer would aim at the systematizing of free trade, the suppression of every restrictive measure, the destruction of artificial barriers, in a word would realize the theory of abundance. It follows, then, that to consult exclusively the immediate interest of the producer is to consult an antisocial interest. To take exclusively for basis the interest of the consumer is to take for basis the general interest. Let me be permitted to insist once more upon this point of view, though at the risk of repetition. A radical antagonism exists between the seller and the buyer. The former wishes the article offered to be scarce, supply small, and at a high price. The latter wishes it abundant, supply large, and at a low price. The laws, which should at least remain neutral, take part for the seller against the buyer, for the producer against the consumer, for high against low prices, for scarcity against abundance. They act, if not intentionally, at least logically, upon the principle that a nation is rich in proportion as it is in want of everything. For, say they, it is necessary to favor the producer by securing him a profitable disposal of his goods. To effect this, their price must be raised. To raise the price, the supply must be diminished, and to diminish the supply is to create scarcity. Let us suppose that at this moment, with these laws in full action, a complete inventory should be made, not by value but by weight, measure, and quantity, of all articles now in France, 
calculated to supply the necessities and pleasures of its inhabitants, as grain, meat, woolen and cotton goods, fuel, etc. Let us suppose again that to-morrow every barrier to the introduction of foreign goods should be removed. Then, to judge of the effect of such a reform, let a new inventory be made three months hence. Is it not certain that at the time of the second inventory, the quantity of grain, cattle, goods, iron, coal, sugar, etc., will be greater than at the first? So true is this, that the sole object of our protective tariffs is to prevent such articles from reaching us, to diminish the supply, to prevent low prices, or, which is the same thing, the abundance of goods. Now I ask, are the people under the action of these laws better fed because there is less bread, less meat, and less sugar in the country? Are they better dressed because there are fewer goods? Better warmed because there is less coal? Or do they prosper better in their labor because iron, copper, tools, and machinery are scarce? But, it is answered, if we are inundated with foreign goods and produce, our coin will leave the country. Well, and what matters that? Man is not fed with coin. He does not dress in gold, nor warm himself with silver. What difference does it make, whether there be more or less coin in the country, provided there be more bread in the cupboard, more meat in the larger, more clothing in the press, and more wood in the cellar? Two restrictive laws, I offer this dilemma. Either you allow that you produce scarcity, or you do not allow it. If you allow it, you confess at once that your end is to injure the people as much as possible. If you do not allow it, then you deny your power to diminish the supply, to raise the price, and consequently you deny having favored the producer. You are either injurious or inefficient. You can never be useful. End of section 1. Recording by Katie Riley. March 2010.